All right, so if you have your maps um, with you, you'll see that Paul has, has, in Acts chapter 17 on his second missionary journey, he's gone over into Macedonia, uh, which is modern-day uh, Greece. Um, he's having trouble right away. He's being chased out of um, several towns, and he's kind of being chased um, down to the south. You know, these Jews from Thessalonica are just, um, they're just, they're rabidly against him. They're getting people stirred up, and they're chasing him from town to town here. We're going to pick things up in verse number 10. Um, in Acts chapter 17 and see what we can um, come up with. Paul goes to, goes to sea um, here in just a few minutes, um, in a few verses, so let's get to that. Verse number 10, the Bible says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, and who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So this is, of course, you know, the famous uh, Bereans here. You know, this is kind of a great example um, for Christians. You know, this is why, you know, you'll see that a, that a Baptist church or a proper um, Bible-believing church um, will be much different than many other of the false churches that are out there today, because not only do um, we preach um, the whole Bible here, not only do I preach the entire Word of God, but I tell you that you should go read the Bible. You know, this is what the Bereans we're doing. It says they received the word with all readiness of mind, but then they went and they looked at what was, what was being said. They searched the Bible themselves. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, I mean, here's the thing. If Christians would do this today, if saved people would do this today, we wouldn't be in the mess that, that we're at. If people were just doing what these Bereans were doing. But the problem is that people are, I think it's just, it's based maybe in laziness. You know, people just want to be fed something to believe. They don't want to go and read the Bible and dig into the Bible, but that's why we, that's why have you turned to all these verses? You know, you're turning to, you know, several verses every single sermon. You go to this verse, go to this verse. You should be searching and reading those things and saying, look, is this really what the Bible says? You know, is this something where somebody's just getting up and just preaching their opinion? No, we're turning to verse after verse after verse after verse, and you should be doing that on your own time. You should be doing that on your own time, searching the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They were reading the Bible every day. That's what we should all uh, be doing. You know, I mean, that's the problem. I mean, if people just knew what the Bible said, I mean, we wouldn't have all these, these stupid doctrines and all this false doctrine out there today. I read, I read um, this week, I mean, Christians have no idea what the Bible says. You know, I read this week that, you know, Christians are saying that, you know, some wicked person that kidnapped and murdered a child should be forgiven. It's like, that's not what the Bible says, but that's what their church says. That's what churches today are saying. This is why, you know, people need to read the Bible. Because then people would go to a church that says evil things like that, and they would not stay in those churches. They would seek out. And then, you know, there would be more Bible-believing churches around there. All right? Look, I mean, the Bible, what a wicked thing to, to teach by the way. I mean, not to go off, but I mean, what a wicked thing to teach. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse number 8. What a wicked thing to teach. And here's the thing, you know, this, this word, this word hate today, this word hate today is completely misunderstood. It's completely misunderstood. People just hear it and they're like, oh, oh, you know, I don't want to be hateful or I don't want to hate. But look what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The Bible is saying that there is a time for that. The Bible is saying that there's a time for that. In verse, I would love to ask Christians that have no idea what the Bible says. I, I would love to ask the pastor of that church or w whatever, you know, what this verse means. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, in verse number 8, where the Bible says, A time to love, a time to hate. A time of war, a time of peace. The Bible says that there is a time for hate. Amen. That there is a time for hate. You know what, and you know what hate means? You know what hate means? If you look up a definition of, of the word, I mean, this is how silly this is. This is how wicked this is. Hate means to extremely dislike something. So you, you see some wicked story on the news of, of some innocent child that's killed or something, and I don't, like, I don't mean to be graphic, but I mean, it just, and, and, then, and then you say, oh, we're to, to love and forgive that person. And, and if, if somebody would say, if somebody would come out and say, I extremely dislike that person, everyone would think that's normal. But then if you say, oh, I, I hate that person, 
which means the exact same thing. Everyone's like, <gasps> it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, this stuff is, is why, this is why people need to know the Bible. So this, you're going to see, by the way, you're going to see more and more of this as people know less and less of the Bible. So don't be surprised when you see these things. Because here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing. If God's not going to forgive this person, and God doesn't love this person, and God's not going to forgive, why should, why should a Christian have to forgive him? Are, are you more loving than God? Are you more forgiving than God? You're like, well, God's not, God doesn't forgive everybody? No. Amen. No. Think of salvation. Somebody that is not saved and dies, just a normal not saved person, and dies, they're, gonna be, they're not going to have their sins forgiven. They're going to be judged by their sins. This is what the Bible says. Then you take somebody that's wicked like that, and that's, you know, I don't have time to go into the doctrine, but I mean, that's an unnatural thing. That's not a natural thing. Most normal people don't get up every day and, and struggle with, you know, I hope I don't kidnap and, and, and murder a child today. It's a wicked thing. What, and you know what? The funny thing is, is this is a stumbling block. This just infuriated me when I saw this this week. This is a stumbling block for people to get saved. When you suggest that somebody like that could possibly be in heaven one day, that is, a, that, is, that is offensive to people. Guess what? People extremely dislike that. When they, when they hear this idea that this God that certain people believe in, this God that Christians believe in, is going to you know, allow somebody like that in heaven. Well, let me just comfort you. This is the comfort that people need to hear. This is the comfort that people need to hear. God will not allow someone like that in heaven. God extremely dislikes that person. And God will take vengeance on that person for eternity in hell. Now that child is in the arms of Jesus. 100%. That's what people need to hear. That's comfort. That's a just God. That is a God that is a perfect judge. None of this other stuff even makes any sense because people have no idea what the Bible says because they don't study it. They just listen to some heretic, feed them garbage, and they just consume it. That's it. But these people studied the Bible daily. They searched the scriptures daily. In 2 Chronicles 19, don't you remember? Don't you remember in 2 Chronicles chapter 19 when Jehoshaphat helped Ahab? You know, the prophet came to him and said, he's like, therefore, because you help those that hate God, therefore is wrath upon thee. Wrath's on you. God's mad at you. God's wrath is on you now. Because you didn't. Because you were, you were loving those that hate the Lord. This is what the Bible actually says. And you know what? The Bible actually makes sense. And it doesn't even, this, this whole, like, never extremely dislike anyone is ridiculous. Because guess what? You know, people, you know, leaders and pastors and churches that, that claim to love everyone, you know what they end up doing? You know who they really hate? They hate innocent children. That's what they hate. I mean, so they're liars just by their actions. Just by their actions of just, you know, first of all, nobody, nobody doesn't dislike anyone. That's, that's not possible. Some liberal in the news the other day said, I hate conservatives. <laughs> he just came on and said, I hate conservatives. I hate them. I think they're terrible people, he said, you know, in some interview somewhere. And I'm just like, yeah, that's true. I'm sure liberals do hate conservatives. I don't agree, but I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, at least he's honest. You know, he extremely dislikes them. That's what he's saying, all right? Look at verse number 12. So look, they're searching the, da the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They weren't just listening, they were actually looking what the Bible says. And good Lord, if we, we had that today, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are right now in this country. Go, go to verse number 12. Therefore, therefore, and guess what? So because they're searching, the, the, these people in verse number 11, they weren't even saved until Paul got there. And Paul, he starts preaching this stuff I mean, this is the coolest thing about the Bereans. You know, you always see, like, that's, a, that's a, a popular name for a Baptist church, Berean Baptist. 
Because, you know, that's a Baptist church where they pick that name because they want their people to be reading the Bible and studying God's word, right? But the funny thing is, these people that when they were searching the scriptures daily, they weren't even saved here. They weren't even saved. But because they searched the scriptures daily, guess what? Remember the sermon from Sunday? What did they do? They, they believed God, right? They believed God. They believed um, the Father. And then when the Son was preached to them, look at verse 12. They got saved. Just like that. Therefore, many of them, therefore meaning because of this, because they were the type of people that searched the scriptures daily, when they heard the gospel, they got saved. Because if you believe the Father, you believe the Son. And if you hear about the Son and you already believe the Father, you're just going to believe the gospel, right? That's why so many people that we run into, whether they you know, are Catholics or, or whoever, you know, if they believe the Bible, that you walk up to their door, you walk up to them on the street, they believe the Bible... They just don't know what it says, and then you preach them the gospel, and they believe the Bible, and you're showing them the Bible, and they just believe in Jesus. It's that simple, all right? Also, honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. But here's the Jews of Thessalonica again. They had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea. And if you look at the map, you'll see that Berea is not that far from Thessalonica. It's just kind of like just inland, just a little bit. They came thither also and stirred up the people. And immediately... The brethren sent Paul away to go, as it were, to sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. So they took Paul and they put him on a ship, and they sent him, they sent him south to Athens. All right, And this is where the story is really going to kick off um, this evening. And then they conducted Paul, they brought him unto Athens, and received a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to join him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw a city Holy given to idolatry. Now we get into Paul with the Athenians, and this is just a really great um, story and just a really great example here. And look at verse 17. It says, Therefore he disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met him. Then, and if you know the history of Greece and Athens, you know, Paul, he just gets right in the middle of it here. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be set a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So there's a lot there in verse number 18. So first of all, like, just a quick, uh, a, a quick information set to the Epicureans and the Stoics here. So if you've heard of, these are like competing philosophies um, you know, of, of the, the Greeks, right? The, the, the famous Greek philosophers. Basically, Epicurus, just to sum him up in, you know, a Cliff's Notes version, he's like, the, he's like the, the ancient version of secular humanism, is what he is. He's preaching secular humanism. He's, pre, he's preaching, preaching isn't the right word, but he's teaching this philosophy to seek personal pleasure, you know, a lot of people would say, like, you know, that compares to, like, hedonism today and just, like, you know, I, we need to find tranquility in our lives and find the most pleasurable thing. Basically, to sum it up, this guy's a hippie. That's what he is, all right? If you look at, like, what we see today that is close to what Epicurus um, taught, he's, he's a hippie. He's a new age, you know, he's sitting cross-legged in, in a field doing drugs going, oh. You know, like this, right? That's who this guy is. Just after his own personal pleasure. Not somebody that you would really, this philosophy is not a philosophy that you would really look at and say, yeah, that's, that's moral in any way at all. So he wasn't really even pushing morality. He was just kind of pushing his own personal, um, you know, pursuit of pleasure, all right? Stoicism, Stoicism, on the other hand, is, is a little bit more interesting. And it's a little bit more hard to, to sum this one up than, than Epicurus. But Stoicism, to, to kind of sum that one up, Stoicism is basically, I would compare Stoicism to the Enlightenment. Because Stoic, Stoicism, and if you don't know what the Enlightenment is, let me sum that up for you in like 30 seconds. Basically, it, Stoicism was pushing ethics. It was pushing ethics and good behavior, these types of things. But what they did was they removed God. Same thing with the Enlightenment. Like, if you ever read, like, a lot of Enlightenment writings from, you know, Rousseau, John Locke, these types of people, what are they pushing? They're pushing, like, nature's law. They're, they're pushing, like, 
the social contract. They're pushing these ethics and these morals that many of us and like a lot of Christians kind of get caught up in that thinking, hey, this is good. This sounds good. Look, I, I like, you know, I've read, you know, most of those writings. But the point is the real problem with the Enlightenment thinkers and Stoicism is they replaced God with nature. If you want to just kind of sum it up into a problem, right? And they replace God with nature. You're like, okay, so what's the big deal? At least they're moral, right? At least they're pushing morals. At least they're pushing ethics. That's why, you know, a lot of Christians have a lot of hard time, you know, hard time with some of the founding fathers that were just deists, right? Look, they weren't saved. They weren't Christian. They were deists. They were kind of along the lines of these Enlightenment thinkers here, right? But we might agree with the morals. We might agree with the laws, all these types of things. So you say, What's the big deal? As long as, you know, they're coming up with good laws and they're coming up with good morals. The problem is, is you can't separate morals from God. And you say, why? Why can't you separate morals from God? I mean, look, if you, there's, we're never going to create a perfect society until Jesus is king, okay? But why can't you separate morals from God? And here's why, just in a sentence or two. You can't separate morals from God. It will never work. Okay, of course those people wouldn't be saved and they're going to go to hell. They believe that and they don't believe in God. That's not really what I'm getting at. I'm, point, I'm getting at why, why mechanically won't it work in a society? Why will mechanically it eventually break down in a society? Here's why. Because nature has no authority over anybody. See? Nature has no authority. Jesus Christ has authority. God has authority. Nobody is accountable, no matter how much the earth worshipers tell you, nobody's accountable to nature. Okay? You know, even though a storm may come and, you know, destroy a town or something, nobody is, a, nature is not a being. You know, but this is what, you know, then you get into, you take the enlightenment and now you get into the new age stuff and what do they do? Mother earth, they turn nature into an actual being. This is where it comes from. Okay, you've removed God, you've turned it into nature, and then you have some offshoots of that that actually make nature a being. But nature is not a being. Nature is a creation of God. Okay, it is God that has the authority. Every man is accountable to God, not nature. And nothing that anybody teaches or, or any philosopher comes up with is going to change that. So that's why it falls apart. All right, so that's just kind of a, just a who these philosophers were and what they were kind of teaching. But is, isn't it interesting that I showed you, that I showed you that, that, how did I describe those to you today? I described these ancient philosophers with things that we're seeing today, right? I described Stoicism with something you saw today. I wrapped up Epicurus and his teachings with, you know, the modern day hippie, basically. Why? Because there's, there's nothing new. That's why. All right, and we'll get into that in just a couple, um, just a couple minutes. All right, but again, one more interesting thing that I want to point out about verse number eighteen is this: it says, "What does this babbler say?" Other some, so some of them, you know, they made fun of them. Others said, "He seemeth to be setter of a setter forth of strange gods." Okay, so right away, there a lot of the people, or some of the people, said that this guy is he's preaching some god, which is interesting because. Why did they think that Paul was preaching? He was, who was he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Right? He's talking about Jesus, but why did they think that Jesus was a God? Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So he's preaching that this man died and rose again from the dead, and right away they just assumed, like, he's preaching about God or preaching about a God. Right? Because, like, everybody knows that if Jesus rose from the dead, even these unsaved secular philosophers knew that if Jesus, this guy, whoever Paul's talking about, rose from the dead, he's a god. He's a god to them. You know, and then Paul, of course, is saying, yeah, well, you're, you're sort of right, except he's the god. But the point is, like, people that are like, oh, Jesus, you know, wasn't god. He never claimed to be god. Just the fact that he rose from the dead, these secular, humanist, hedonist, Wicked philosophers are like, yeah, he's definitely preaching about a God here. Because, like, normal people can't die and, like, raise themselves from the dead. All right? Who else could do that? They knew. Philosophy. Philosophy. There's only one time that this word is used in the Bible other than here. Or one other time, I should say. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. So you got these philosophers. And they're debating 
with Paul. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Let's just look at this, drill into this word philosophy just a little bit. Because, I mean, the Bible warns us about philosophy. So let's find out what it is and why we need to be warned about it. The definition of philosophy is the study of the, the, study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, existence, and especially when considered as an academic discipline. So it's basically the fundamental, um, it's the study of nature, knowledge, reality, and existence. You know, who are we? Why are we here? Basically, it's a replacement. It's a replacement study for people that don't know what the Bible says, don't want to know what the Bible says. So if you get rid of the Bible, here's the thing. Here's why philosophy exists. If you get rid of the Bible out of your life, you got to have something. you got to have something because the person that has no Bible in their life and no philosophy in their life, they just have nothing but questions. There's no answers. So what they're trying to do is people that don't have, like they don't, they're not the Bereans, they don't have the Bible, they don't have the Word of God, these are Gentiles, and not only just Gentiles, but these people are way off the deep end, they've replaced God's Word with just this study of why, trying to answer all these questions themselves that the Bible has all the answers to. All right, look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Look what the Bible says. It says, beware, it's warning us against this, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition that, th this is basically what philosophy is right here, the tradition of men and rudiments of the world and not after Christ. That's such a great verse right there because the Bible is saying, it's like, look, just people are going to come at you and try to come at you with the traditions of the world and not Christ because Christ is the Bible. Christ is the Word of God. Like the Bible is Christ. Christ is the Bible. It's the same thing. It's the same exact same. So people are going to come at you with the opposite of that, which is the traditions of men, like what men think, what men that don't believe the Bible think. In 1 Corinthians 2.13, I'll just read it for you. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Again, it's saying man's wisdom is going to try to come in here and replace, you know, what God's wisdom is says you know this is a spiritual book read you know find me another book that you could read a hundred times in your life and you'll learn new things every single time you read it there's no other book there's no other book that applies to every person that's ever lived since the beginning till now no other book no other book it's a miracle in itself just the fact that it exists but the bible here is telling us in these two verses and we're seeing it like play out with paul is that when people don't have the Bible, they'll try to replace it with, with man's ideas. All right, so that's, um, that's what's going on. That's what philosophy actually is. Go to verse number 19 of Acts chapter 17. So Paul, Paul is, is getting attacked by these philosophers because look, what they're teaching is contrary to what, what he believes, okay? And what he believes is contrary to what they believe. Look at verse 19. And they took him in and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. They want to hear them. And then in verse number 21, it explains why. It says, For all the Athenians and the strangers that were, with, that were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So here are these people. They're caught up. They can't wait to hear what Paul says in this case, because they love to hear new stuff. They love to hear new theories, new what? New philosophies, all right? So look, people still do this today. People do this today. People are arrogant, they're prideful, but here's the thing that we need to understand. The Bible isn't some new invention for, you know, us to improve upon. You know, people will try to do this with the Bible. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. There's two problems. All right, there's two problems here. I'm going to read for you verse 21 again as you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Because there's two problems with people that are coming there. They're, they're, as the Bible says here, it says they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new things. So we see two problems here. There's people telling all these new things, and there's people listening to them. There's two problems, right? But here's the interesting thing. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, written by Solomon. At this point, the wisest man that's ever lived. God gave him all this wisdom. God said, there will never be a wiser person than you, you know, other than Jesus Christ. I mean, Solomon, was the, you know, he's the wisest person on the earth. Look at what he says in verse number one, or verse number nine, I'm sorry, of chapter 
number one. This is so interesting about Solomon because when you think about the context of who he is, so he's just a little kid, and just to give you an idea where this came from, he's just a little kid, and God asked him, what do you want? What do you want? He just became king. You know, I don't know. I think he was probably a teenager at least at that point, but he became king. God says, what do you want? And he said, give me an understanding heart. And God was so pleased that he asked for that and that he didn't ask for money and riches and, you know, the heads of his enemies, that God gave him everything. He said, oh, I'm going to make you the wisest person that's ever lived, and I'm going to give you riches and everything that you've ever wanted. So here's the, the wisest man that's ever lived. And once he realizes all this wisdom, look what he comes to as a conclusion. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. I know we've heard this verse before, but think about it in that context. Look at verse the thing that hath been done is that which shall be. He's, the thing that hath been, sorry, is that which shall be. He's saying the past will be like the future is what he's saying. Okay, And that which is done, that which shall be done. He's saying the thing that is in the past is the same thing that will be in the future. And the things that are done, the actions that are taken in the past, will be the same actions that are taken in the future. And there is no new thing under the sun. And then he says, is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. So think about this. God downloads on this guy. God like plugs him into all wisdom and just downloads on him. And he knows all, like he just knows all this wisdom. And what is the conclusion that he comes to? What, did he learn a bunch of new stuff? No, he's like, oh, it's all the same. It's all the same. You know, it's just like, it's, look, you know what will give you this same wisdom? You want to be as wise as Solomon? You know what will give you this same wisdom? And if you've read the Bible cover to cover, you've gotten this wisdom. If you read the Bible cover to cover, and you do it again and again and again, you know what wisdom you will get? This is why the history in the Bible is there, by the way. Because you sit there and you read the Bible, and you read the, the history of the nation of Israel, you know, you read the history as they come out of Egypt, you read the history as they go into the promised land, you read the history as they break into two kingdoms, you read the history as the north, you know, goes bad 160 years before the south, and then you read how the south goes bad and gets, you know, judged by God, it's just God's judgment, God's judgment, God's judgment, God's judgment, and then a page over, they get right, and then a page over, they get judged again, and then a page over, they get right, and a page over, they get judged again, and you're just like, man, do you think God's trying to show you something here? He's trying to show us that men with men, nothing is new under the sun. So why? So we can look at that and we can look at ourselves and be like, what are we going to do? What's, what's going to be the future of this civilization that we're living in right now? You know what the future of this civilization that we're going to be living in right now? is going to be what happened in the past. What's coming to us is what came to them. If we do, I mean, you look, you look at all the things that we're doing. Look at all the things. I mean, there's nothing new. They used to actually teach this in public school in the 80s, in social studies. They taught in so I, I, they can't teach it now. There's no way they could teach it now. But they're, they're teaching like, they used to teach like the cycle. It wasn't from a biblical standpoint, but it's basically what Solomon is saying. They're saying the cycle of civilizations and their fall is the same every time. And in there was a fall from morality was a fall from, you know, morals, whatever they call that, right? A fall from the natural, you know, state of men or whatever, right? Whereas the Bible would say, you know, going against God's word, right? Or perverting God's word or whatever you want to do. But look, the point is, that's why the history is there. God gave it to us because if we get that knowledge, we realize, hey, we're going to repeat this. He's trying to show us this. We're doing the same that they did. That's what God is showing. That's what Solomon was saying. I mean, he's trying to show you, like, you know, you look around and, you know, we're like, man, I mean, because you look around today, you look around today, it seems like every month it's worse. You're like, clown world's getting crazier and crazier. Men are women, women, women are men. You know, um, we're, we're loving child killers. I mean, you're, you're just like, you just like, it, it's going crazy. But here's the thing, it, it, you know, we're, we're accepting all kinds of perversion. Let's put the perversion in the school. Let's put all the, all the, all the sickos, as, as many sickos as we can in the schools with all the kids. Like, we're hating children, all these things. And another thing you'll find with all these civilizations that have fallen, 
the people that suffer the most and suffer first are the children every single time from Manasseh all the way back to you know Babel to all the way to today it's all the same thing that's what Solomon's saying God downloads everything on him he's like oh man all this new stuff I learned no he's like oh it's all the same it's like men are really unwise because it's just repeating the same patterns over and over and over all right so look you don't have to like I mean, yeah, be shocked at all the things and how bad it's going to get, but like, you don't need to really be surprised because it's it's, what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, same thing that happened to them. It's the same thing. There's nothing new. All right, so the problem, the problem is that people like to come up with new things. Back to, back to the sermon. People like to come up with new things. That's the first problem, okay, is, is you get the, you know, people that want to look at the Bible especially. This is the worst. I've, I've told many of the guys that, that preach here, the only real advice that I've, I've given to people that preach here, like the, the guys at the church, is like, hey, you know, just, just, just grab a basic doctrine and, and preach on it. That's it. You know, I mean, you always find the guy that, you know, has got to find some new weird thing in the Bible. And like, you know, quite frankly, I worry about those people. Because there's reasons that people want to go and find some new thing. And, it, and it's usually vanity. You want people to think how smart you are or whatever. But man, you better not be playing that game with the Bible. Right? Because the Bible, there's no new thing in the Bible. All right? I mean, yes, there's different perspectives and there's different, you know, it's always nice to hear different people preach from, for me because I like, you know, oh, you know, you know, sometimes people will explain a verse different and things like that. But I mean, the doctrines, they're, they're there, they're the same, and, you know, there you go, right? But the problem is, number two, is with these Athenians, is not only are there people that are always kind of coming up with new things for vain reasons, is that there's people willing to listen to it. There's people willing to listen to these people. I mean, if there's a bunch of, if there's a church full of Bereans and somebody got up and preached some new thing, the Bereans are going to be like, ah, that's not what the Bible says. You know, then, you know, if, if, you know, I get up and start preaching some weird new thing, hopefully the people in this church that study the Bible and read the Bible are going to be like, hey, that's not what the Bible says. And hopefully you're with the Bible. You know, you're with the word of God, all right? Go back to verse number 22 of Acts chapter 17. Verse number 22 of Acts chapter 17. There's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. And Paul knew this. He walks in, and all these people are just, they, I mean, at least it's, it's why they wanted to listen to Paul, right? Because it was something that they hadn't heard before. Look at verse number 22 of Acts Chapter 17, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. I, you know, you can kind of compare the, the unknown God to, to nature, to Mother Earth, or to whatever else people are replacing with God. I mean, you have these people, they literally have a monument that says, to the unknown God. We're like, we don't know who God is, but they're worshiping this anonymous thing. And Paul's just like, what? And he says, a God that made the world and all things, therein seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He's like, Paul says, God, like God, like Jesus God, is the one that made all this stuff. He's like, you're worshiping what? The creation, right? They're worshiping the crea creation and not the creator. But he calls them superstitious. Why? What, is, what does superstition mean? What does that word superstition mean? He says they're superstitious because basically what they're doing is they're, they're part of these people at least that were taking this philosophy and they were trying to make some divine thing out of it you know, like nature, like this unknown God. But basically superstition, what it means, is an excessive belief in supernatural causation. So it's this excessive belief that everything is caused by, it doesn't have to be God. I mean, it could just be anything. This is, this is people who have like, this is why like Christians really shouldn't be like relying on luck. Christians really shouldn't say, oh, you know, I mean, I know it's a common saying like, oh, that was lucky or whatever, but I mean, Christians really shouldn't believe in luck and be relying on luck because that's, it's superstitious. 
It's superstitious. It's belief that there's some, you know, unknown uh, luck force out there that if I do something a certain way, you'll, you'll see like people that are really like addicted to gambling are like this. Like they'll, they'll do things, things a certain way. They'll put their favorite lucky pants on or whatever it is and, you know, go and think that they're going to make all kinds of money. I mean, the casinos must love that. But, I mean, the point is, like, they rely on this just superstition, you know, oh, don't say that, or, you know, you tell some people, like, hey, it's going to be a great day today. Oh, you just jinxed it. It's like, what in the world? You can't even be a positive person? Like, it's a superstitious person, right? Some people are really, really superstitious. I mean, you'll find even some, like, I mean, Catholics are very superstitious, very superstitious. I mean, they're very superstitious about idols and they're very very idolatrous like they must have these things with them and and like it can get really strange right but here's a question for you paul's like kind of you know chastising these people for being superstitious let me ask you this can christians be superstitious the answer to this question is absolutely and what does that mean what do i mean it, it means this excessive belief in supernatural so for the christian it would be in causation by god so, like, I think that, that God just, like, I'm going to give you two examples of Christians, how Christians can be the type of people that can be superstitious that are actually saved people. You're like, what do you mean? Give me, just give you some examples. People that are just, like, an extreme, extreme way, an extreme person that's superstitious and saved is, like, God told me to do this. God told me to go here. God told me to turn left. And God told me to go here. And, you know, look, we're, we all have the Holy Spirit in us, and I hope the Holy Spirit leads you in your life, and you should be led of the Holy Spirit and not of the flesh. But when you're literally saying to people, like, God, like, like verbally spoke to me in my car and told me to turn at this stoplight, you know, that's, that's a superstitious person, all right? Then there's, there's this guy. It's just that any, any opportunity that ever has been put in front of me is of God. That's a superstitious person. That's a superstitious person. And, and you say, why? Well, first of all, there's two reasons why Christians will do this. The first one, in my experience, is this. They're just lying to sound more spiritual. You know, I mean, I want, I want you to think that I, I've, heard, I've heard pastors do this. Like, get up and be like, you know, I, I just knew that the, the Lord just put that song on my heart, and then the choir sang it. It was just miraculous. You know, just trying to, like, make themselves sound like more, no pastor that I'm friends with, okay? But, I mean, the point is, like, I've heard this kind of stuff, you know, from the pulpit. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to make themselves look very spiritual. You know, somebody that, that, that talks like that, like, God just told me and God just led me down, just constantly talks like that, is trying to make you think that they are spiritual, all right? Look, God speaks to me for real. God speaks to me. He speaks to me through the Bible. He speaks to me, you know, I speak to God through prayer. And God, if I can get, if we can all get our, our flesh and the sin and get right, get right with God and get, you know, get the sin out of our lives, God and the Holy Spirit will lead you in your life. Don't get me wrong, okay? But the minute I stand up here and say that, you know, God speaks to me audibly every Saturday night, you know, that's, God speaks to us through the Bible, okay? And look, quite frankly, there's nothing else that he needs to say to us, right? He's still going to be active in our lives. Miracles are real. All these things are real. God is active on this earth. Don't get me wrong, but that's one reason that people are, are suspicious. They're just, you know, or, or superstitious is they're just trying to look spiritual. That's number one. The second one is just immaturity, is just just spiritual immaturity in your Christian life. And I'm not talking about how old you are or even how many years you've been saved. I'm just talking about how mature you are as a Christian. Because if you think that every opportunity that comes your way is of God, then you are a very immature Christian. You are a babe in Christ. Okay, because look, I hate to break it to you folks, but the devil can put opportunity in front of you too. I mean... The devil is walking on this earth. Look at Job. The devil is on this earth making things happen. There are demons on this earth that are working for him. So the 
problem is, is like when people say, oh, God opened this door for me or God showed me this, and they just assume that it's God. I mean, really what it is is people just, you know, they just, they just want to know. You know, they just want to justify what they really want to do anyway. You know, so they pin it on God. All right, turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. Let me give you a, um, an example. There's a lot of examples in this in the Bible. But the answer, you say, like, how, how am I going to know, like, what's of God and what's not? It's very simple. I'm going to show it to you. All right, but let me give you an example of people that they're just blinded. They're blinded, and it gives you the reason why they were blinded, and they just, like, made up. They just made up to themselves what, what their reality was. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 10. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 10. Look at it like superstitious people and people that are just like, everything's from God. Everything that comes my way is from God. Look at verse number 10. It says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Hear. Behold, their ear is uncircumcised. Meaning, they're not listening to spiritual things. And they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. So these people do not know the word of God, and they don't want to know the word of God. All right? They are the opposite of the Bereans. Verse 11, Therefore I am full of fury from the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out on the children abroad and on the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, and the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others, and their fields and wives together. So I'll stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. From the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. So these people, they love mammon. So now, we kind of get an example, we kind of get a, a reason in verse number 13 on why they didn't, why they didn't want to hear the word of God. They didn't want to hear the word of God because they were just, they're covetous, they're in the world. They just, they love mammon, which means they, they hate God. They extremely dislike the word of God, all right? They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So these people, so God's saying, all this judgment, let me just break this down for you so you understand what I'm trying to say. In verse number 10, they're not listening to God. Jeremiah's like, they're not listening. They don't even want to hear, they don't want to know what the word of God says. And then in the next couple verses, it just talks about how the judgment of God is going to come upon them. I mean, there's a lot of trouble coming to these people. If you read those verses again, there's a lot of trouble coming to these people who have these uncircumcised ears and won't listen to the word of God. And then he says, he gives the reason for why they're like that, because they're covetous, they're in the world, they don't care about the word of God, they only care about money, they only care about, um, you know, those thorns wrapped around their neck. But then it says what they tell the people. What they tell the people, they tell the people, everything's great. This is so common in the Bible when it talks to people that are about to be judged. They're like, God doesn't, God doesn't care what's going on down here. That's what they're telling the people. But let me ask you something. When they say peace, peace, is there really peace? When they say peace, peace to the people, and it says people were comforted with that. So people were comforted when these, these wicked people that didn't want to hear the word of God came to them and said, it's fine, it's okay. You know, there were some people that were maybe raising up questions, raising up concerns about how the country was going. And they're just like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, peace, peace. But guess what? There was no peace. Because every single good thing that is put in front of you is not necessarily good. So you better be careful when opportunities pop into your life and come into your face and you're just like, this seems like it's something that I really want. And this opportunity comes and maybe there's a bunch of people behind that opportunity that say, this is great. Great job. You deserve this. Peace. Peace. But if you don't know what the Bible says, there could be no peace there. It could be the opposite of peace. You could be walking right into God's judgment. So you're like, now I'm confused. How would I possibly know? Well, be a Berean. Let's bring it back to where we started. Be a Berean. Don't be wrapped up in the world. Don't be covetous. And then you'll easily want to know, and it's easy to know, Look, when something, here's the test. When something comes in front of you, when something comes in front of you, all you have to ask yourself is, will this help or will this hurt the kingdom of God? That's it. Will this help or will this hurt the kingdom of God? As if God is not capable of blessing us and keeping us in the Christian life at the same time. It's a really easy test. You know, but the problem is, sometimes... 
we want something so bad that we get superstitious about it. And we're like, yeah, there's just no way. There's no way that that guy could have quit that job at that time and then they could have you know, moved this department over here and then asked me to fill that position and, and now I have to move somewhere where there's no church. But that, that, must, that was of God because that was, it's not of God. How do I know it's not of God? Because you getting out of church, is it hurts the kingdom of God. Because you moving your family to somewhere where there is no church hurts the kingdom of God. That's how you know it's not of God. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Because God, let me tell you something about God. Let me tell you something I know for sure about God. He will never contradict himself. So if the voice you're hearing in your head doesn't match the words of the Bible, or what's coming in front of you and the opportunities that are set in front of you doesn't match what God says in the Bible, it's not God, my friends. It's not the Lord. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 24. Jesus points this out to the Pharisees. I, I love, I love these three verses in the Bible right here. Look at these three verses. You know, Jesus had a sense of humor. He was very clever. I mean, of course, he's God. That's a silly thing to even say. But he's very clever with the way he dealt with people. Look at verse number 24. It says, but when the Pharisees heard it. So Jesus, Jesus just cast out a demon from somebody. Right? He just, there's this demon-possessed person. He just cast out a demon. When the Pharisees heard it, that he cast out this demon, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. You know what he's saying? He's like, you know, Beelzebub's like Satan. So they're saying, like, you know how he's casting out Satan, you devils by, by the power of Satan? And Jesus is like, what? He's like, what? Are you, are you morons? No, he doesn't say that. But look what he says. And Jesus knew their thoughts. And said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And then he says, if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? He's like, you think that Satan's going around, like, destroying his own kingdom? He's like, what? He's like, what in the world? That doesn't even make any sense. But the point is, Jesus is literally saying here, he's like, look, God's not going to ever tell you something that's against the Bible. That's why there's all these rules. You know, there's this structure that God gave. There's a structure of, of the church. Jesus Christ, you know, pastor. There's a structure of the family. There's, there's the, the husband who has a wife that submits to the husband, and then the children are below their parents. But notice how it says, like, when the children obey their parents, there's always that caveat in there, like, in the Lord. Because... God would never contradict himself. So it's not, God's not going to ever tell the child, like, hey, hey, you have to obey your parents, even if they're telling you something against the Bible. Because God is always putting that complete direction in there. Same thing with the wife. You know, my wife has to submit to my authority. My wife has to submit to me as a, as a biblical wife. But not if I'm telling her something that's unbiblical. Then it's Romans 13, always, you know, the higher powers. Because God, I mean, God's not going to contradict himself. He's not going to say, hey, this is, how the, the, this is the, my complete word and direction to you, and then put some child under the authority of some wicked parent and be like, yes, they just have to listen to everything that they say no matter what. Because that would be God contradicting himself. So he covers all that in the Bible. I mean, God can't be against his own kingdom. So back to the point. When you want to feel superstitious and think that everything that ever happens to you, God laid at your feet, Measure it against his kingdom. Always. And you measure it against his kingdom. Look, it's not that hard. Especially, bringing it back to where we started, if you're a Berean. Because you can't really measure it against something. You'd be like, ah, does this contradict what God would want? If you have no idea what God wants. But you're somebody that knows what the Bible says. You're somebody that studies the Bible. You're somebody that reads the Bible. You're somebody that understands the word of God that he's given you, that he has spoken to you through his, his word, through his son. And then something comes to you and you're just like, oh, yeah. Hey, look, it, it's, it's like a five-minute thing, man. I'm telling you. It's easy. It's easy, but you got to know what it says. All right? But people that get up in covetous, just like Jeremiah chapter 6, they lie to themselves. They lie to themselves. Just know the Bible and follow it. All right, so look, we're going we're gonna to stop here for tonight. Paul's debating these modern philosophers. He's debating these modern philosophers. Thank goodness that they wanted to hear a new thing because a few of them got saved. But the point is, 
our answer, it really, our answer to dealing with philosophy, dealing with vain deceit, dealing with all these things, dealing with superstition in our lives, it just comes back to verse number 11, which is to just, you'll receive the word of God if you're not into a bunch of sin, and then just search the scriptures daily. It's, it's that simple. It's such a great example of how we should be in our lives. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.